Yo, 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 what's good with it? Um, it's the homie Mac, music, art, culture, knowledge, reporting live from the Dogon, 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 each one, teach one, peace and love. Um, yeah, this is a, um, another session of Mackin' with Mac. I'm doing two Mac and Mac sessions back to back. The last one was uh, the teachings of Tahotep, the oldest book in the world. Um, today I'm going to be reviewing uh, none other than uh, Soul on Ice. Um, this is actually my father's book. <laughs> like literally, like my dad wrote his name in here. He took notes in this book. Uh, salute to my father. Um, this book, I actually, in reading this book, I felt like it made me close to my father in a lot of ways. Salute to the big homie. Um, yeah, just seeing his notes in here is pretty dope. Uh, this book is a collection of essays uh, written by Eldridge Cleaver. Who is Eldridge Cleaver? Eldridge Cleaver, um, thumbs up, give me the likes. Thumbs up, give me the likes. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Um, who is Eldridge Cleaver? Glad you asked. Um, I want to give some pretty protracted, calculated responses. Um, let's see. Uh, one second. Give me one second. Eldridge Cleaver went on to become a prominent member of the Black Panthers, having the titles of Minister of Information and head of, international sec and head of the International Section of the Black Panthers. Uh, he was the husband of Kathleen Cleaver. Uh, Elder Cleaver died, I want to say, like, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but back, backtrack. Let, let's get let, back on track, back on track. Cleaver... Um, was the head of the international section of the Panthers while a fugitive from the U.S. criminal justice system in Cuba and Algeria. Cleaver was convicted with a series of crimes including burglary, assault, rape, and attempted murder. It eventually served time in Folsom and San Quentin prisons until being released on parole in 1968. In 68, he became a fugitive after leading... In 68, he became a fugitive after leading an ambush on Oakland police officers, during which two officers were wounded. Cleaver was wounded during the clash, and Black Panther member Bobby Hutton, little Bobby Hutton, R.I.P., was killed. As editor of the official Panthers newspaper, The Black Panther, Cleaver's influence on the direction of the party was rivaled only by founders Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale. Uh, Cleaver and Newton eventually fell out with each other, resulting in a split that weakened the party. Very tragic. Uh, <laughs> very tragic. Um, but back to it. Uh, Cleaver acknowledges committing acts of rape, stating that he initially raped black women in the ghetto for practice, and then embarked on the serial rape of white women. He described these crimes as politically inspired, motivated by a genuine, by, motivated by a genuine conviction that the rape of white women was an insurrectionary act. When you read Solonites, it kind of, you can kind of see why he thought that. Not saying it was right. I'm not an apologist for rape. When he began writing Solon Ice, he unequivocally renounced rape and all his previous, and all his previous reasoning behind, about it. The essays in Solon Ice are divided into four thematic sections. Letters from Prison, describing Cleaver's experiences with and thoughts on crime in prisons. Blood, man, hold up. Blood of the Beast, discussing race relations and promoting black liberation ideology. Prelude to Love, three letters. Love letters, written to Cleaver's attorney, Beverly Axelrod. And lastly, White Woman, Black Man, on gender relations, black masculinity and sexuality. So here we are. Um, 
Yeah, so like I, as as I stated, uh, this book is a series of essays that uh, Eldridge Cleaver wrote. Um, yeah, uh, letters from prison. Uh, you know, and that, I'm, I'm gonna go by it bit by bit on all the impasses in this in this book. But uh, thumbs up, give me the likes. Thumbs up, give me the likes. Um, yeah, so letters from prison. He starts to talk about his, you know, his, just his evolution. You know, what his crimes were, why, you know, what it, what, what was the impetus behind said crimes, and um, you can kind of just see his transition. Him, it's, it, was, it was it was very self reflective. Um, him essentially just saying how. Uh, hold up! No! 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 I don't want, let me let me go, let me backtrack backtrack backtrack. Um, I want to pull from all three, all four. Let's see. Uh, reminds me of my student teacher when I was teaching. Uh, <laughs> chapter one: Letters from Prison. Uh, here's a poem he wrote. It and uh, he says, "I love you to to a white girl. To a white girl, I love you because you're white, not because you're charming or bright." Your whiteness is a silky thread snacking through snacking through my thoughts in red hot patterns of lust and desire. I hate you because you're white. Your white meat is nightmare food. White is the skin of evil. You're my Moby Dick. White witch, symbol of the rope and hanging tree of the burning cross. Loving you thus and hating you so. My heart is torn in two, crucified. Uh, I, and I became a rapist to, re to refine my technique and modus operandi. I started out by practicing on black girls in the ghetto. In the black ghetto where dark and vicious deeds would appear not as aberrations or deviations from the norm. But as a part of the sufficiency of the evil of a day, and when I considered myself smooth enough, I crossed the tracks and sought out white prey. I did this consciously, deliberately, willfully, methodically. Though looking back, I see that I was in a frantic, wild, and completely abandoned frame of mind. Rape was an, ins an insurrectionary act. It delighted me that I was defying and trampling upon the white man's law. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> in this book, he pretty much extols how, you know, white women have been pretty much the centerpiece for white supremacy. How white women have been put on a pedestal. They've been pedestalized. Uh, white men have dangled them in front of other races of men. And said this is the prize. So I guess in some ways I can see how him raping a white woman. Is almost like to give the middle finger to white supremacy. Like look what I conquered you. Because I conquered your woman. Again I'm not an apologist for rape. Rape is no bueno. No good. No 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 no. But I, I, I guess I can I see how he looked at that as an act of violence or an act of rebellion. Um, there's another stuff. At one part in the book, uh, he talks about how he had a, a white woman. Was this, when he was in Folsom, not San Quentin, but in Folsom. I think Folsom. Uh, this is all California. He pretty much said how um, he had a pinup of a white woman in his cell. And... When he came back to, when, when, I guess there was like a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but he left his cell and he came back. And when he came back, uh, some guard had ripped the black, had ripped the white woman, the, the pinup, she, she, he said she was from Esquire, saw the pinup, ripped it out and threw it in the commode. And, um, he said it was like he had developed an attachment to that pinup, and how that that uh, that, that pinup the the white woman, um, it was she represented like she really she pretty much encapsulated his his concept of white beauty, not just white beauty, but what, just what was attractive, what was beautiful, what was pristine. It was a white woman. It was a white woman, um, and he actually had developed an emotional attachment to a piece of paper. That piece of paper represented an ideology that was foisted upon him via white supremacy. Um, conditioning. Um, 
and he said how pretty much the guard was like, I don't have, a, you know, you you boys, I don't care what y'all have on your walls, you know, just don't have a white girl up there, you know, don't don't you n words have no white girl up there, and he said he cursed out the guard for doing it, but uh, I think I don't know, I th I just think that it was very telling how uh, essentially how white women became the archetypal of image of beauty. And later on in the book, he says, you know what? I don't even think it was something that was calculated. It's just white white men were in power. And whatever, whatever was beautiful to them, that's what they pontificated in media, in textbooks, school books, everything. You know, it is what it is. Not even just textbooks, but like uh, um, just all media. Film, magazines. White women. White women were pedestalized. Um, yeah, so let me go. Shout out to my pops. My pops had a lot of dope uh, highlights in this book. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I want to quote something. This comes from Lazarus Come Forth. Um Com competition is the law of the jungle and cooperation is the law of civilization. Let me say this again. Competition is the law of the jungle and cooperation is the law of civilization. When you study the Black Panther Party, you understand their critiques, the Black Panther Party, you understand their critiques on um, capitalism. Um, you see how they're pretty much, uh, I don't even necessarily want to say that they were uh, Marxist. Maybe they were, uh, yeah, Marxist, Marxist ideology, but more along the line, Marxist, Marxist, Leninist ideology, definitely. But their leanings were more socialism. Their whole thing was, it doesn't make any sense to have, man, it's hot. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to have a bunch of wealthy people with, all, with, with just untold wealth living in close proximity to people who are living in object poverty. You know, and one thing that I learned from the Black Panther Party uh, was that, you know, poverty is more of a systemic failure. It's not an individual failure. Uh, capitalism needs a loot. Capitalism is about winners and losers. For capitalism to function correctly, for capitalism to function, um, someone has to get screwed. We all can't win. Um, and I heard some people say, well, at least in capitalism, you have a chance to win. Yeah, but the thing is, I can start a business tomorrow, and in theory, I can compete against Jeff Bezos, but in probability, I'm not going to beat Jeff Bezos. <laughs> you know, so let's, uh, let's keep everything in context. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Give me one second. I thought it was very interesting. He brought up, he's, in his book, he speaks on Marcus Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, and even Paul Robeson. Um, the black militant policy are the careers of Marcus Garvey, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Paul Robeson. Garvey, who in the first quarter of this century sparked a black mass movement based in America, but international in scope and potential, was cast into federal prison and then exiled to England. W.B. Du Bois, one of the intellectual giants of the modern world, was silenced and isolated in America as viciously and effectively as a racist regime in South Africa has has silenced, isolated, and isolated such leaders of the black masses as Chief Albert Luthu, Luthuli, or as the British in Kenya once silenced and isolated Jomo Kenyatta. Um, I like how he points towards the African diaspora and how uh, Pan-Africanism, I mean, I know some people, um, that's a whole other conversation, but Pan-Africanism is needed. Uh, the whole African diaspora, we have been broken asunder. Uh, we are all black people. Let's let's unite and bring forth justice. It's not about uh, it, it's not about being being in a position where you can just subjugate others. No, it's about bringing forth justice. Let's do that um, and let's be united. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Again, this book is a series of essays. This is from uh, 
to all black women from all black men. I greet you, my queen, not in the obsequious whine of a cringing slave to which you have become accustomed. Neither do I greet you in a new voice, the, un the uncutious, I don't know if I, un uncutious, uncutious supplications of the sleek black bourgeoisie. Nor the bully, bullying, bu nor the bullying bellow, nor the bullying bellow of the rude free slave. But in my own voice do I greet you, the voice of the black man. And although I greet you anew, my greeting is not new, but as old as the sun, moon, and stars. And rather than mark a new beginning, my greeting, my, my greeting signifies only my return. I will return from the dead. I speak to you now from the here and now. I was dead for 400 years. For 400 years you have been a woman alone, bereft of her man, a manless woman. For 400 years I, have not, I, have, I was neither your man nor my own man. The white man stood between us, over us, around us. The white man was your man and my man. Do not pass lightly over this truth, my queen, for even though the fact of this has burned into the, the, mark, the marrow of our bones and diluted our blood, we must bring it to the service of the mind and to the realm of knowing. Glue our gaze upon it and stare at it as a coiled serpent in a baby's playpen or the fresh flowers on a mother's grave. It is to be pondered and realized in the heart, for the heel of the white man's boot is our point of departure, our point of resolve and return, the blessed and pivot of our future. But I would ask you to recall that before we could come up from slavery, we had to be pulled down from our throne. Let me say, he said, the blood stained pivot of our future, but I would ask you to recall that before we could come up from slavery, but I would ask you to recall that before we could come up from slavery, we had to be pulled down from our throne. We've been ripped from our righteous positioning.